It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. And the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network is brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. A couple of little reverberations after Scheffler's win at the Masters. Uh, first, it was clear that at least watching the Butler Cabin festivities and the green jacket ceremony, that John Rahm was very uncomfortable. Um, I know people wondered about the amateur and he looking off to the side. Hey, he could have been looking at his parents. Who cares what he was looking at? I, that doesn't interest me. But clearly Rahm wasn't very comfortable and it wasn't very warm and fuzzy between he and, and, and Scheffler. Now, he and Scheffler are rivals, there's no question. I mean, right now, Scheffler is the best player in the world without any dispute. And I would think most people would make Rom the number two player in the world, despite what he's done going off to uh, live. Uh, but clearly, he wasn't comfortable, at least to my viewpoint, in Butler Cabin. And checking and talking to some folks in, in, since the end of the Masters uh, broadcast, uh, that was the case. He did not seem very comfortable. He wasn't very comfortable. And he even made a couple of comments yesterday that some of the players were not very friendly to them going back to defend his title uh, after having made the move to live. Now, uh, that's normal. I mean, he's a competitor. Chef was a competitor. Rivalries between top players are normal. You know, heated moments between top players are normal. You can go back to Jack and 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 Watson for many of those. Um, they had great respect, but they would be at each other's throats in competition. Um, so the fact that Rom felt some of that, some of it's probably sensitivity. Otherwise, you know, it's not surprising. The big story coming out of the Masters is that Evidently, Rory McIlroy is very close to signing some outrageous deal with Liv, which is going to be another shot to the PGA. And there's talk of him getting... Now, we don't know how real the money is. We don't know if it's upwards of $600 million. Who cares at that point? $600, 700 750 550 Who cares what he gets? And part ownership of one of those teams. See, they're telling these guys, like McElroy and Rahm, that those teams that they are part of in Live Golf are going to be worth a lot of money in the years to come. I, I don't understand it because I think the team concept that Live plays under is ridiculous. I think it's terrible. I don't think it's compelling. I don't like it at all. I don't watch Liv. I don't know anybody who does. Uh, and I don't like the team concept at all. I, don't, I think golf is an individual sport. It should maintain being an individual sport. But here's the thing. McElroy leaves. It is another shot. And it's anything but a step towards peace or a step towards unification between the two bodies. What it is is more aggressiveness and more acrimony between the two sides. Then, of course, you figure, what is Liv going to do? They're going to go after Oberg. Hey, here's a foreign player who is clearly the next big star. Everybody in golf says it. Everybody said it before the Masters. He went out in his first major and played brilliantly, finished second. If he didn't hit the ball in the water on 11, who knows where he would have finished. He was stupendous in his play, uh, showed everything that you would want from a, a, a young and rising star. So imagine what he would be worth to live and what a shot that would be to the PGA if he goes. Then you have the Hoggard twins. Nikolai Hoggard played very well until Sunday when he collapsed. But you have those two who have already won on the European tour. Those two twins, they would be two more very, very good prospects who would be maybe on their way to live. The boundless amount of money continues to take its toll. And I tell you, the PJ has to get on its knees tonight and say a prayer 
that there is no way that Scotty Scheffler ever thinks of going to live because that would be the finishing touch. That would be, it would be over for the PGA. The PGA would not recover from that kind of move. That's how important Scheffler has become. Tiger's completely through you saw it. I mean, let's be honest. He cannot play three or four rounds. He got through two rounds, and then on two nice days, he played terrible golf. Shot 15 over the last two days. Had the worst score he ever had for a 72-hole competition. But he just, his body can't do it anymore. There's no fill. He's off in obscurity and live, but he's off. And he's old anyway. So it's now Scheffler and obviously other players and good young players, but as these guys are paired off, if McElroy goes, and after that, if they target Oberg and he goes, and I don't know that Oberg's going. I haven't heard anything about that. I have heard the rumors about McElroy. They are very strong. The PGA has Scheffler. They have Spieth, and everything I've heard is that those two especially have no interest in live golf. They better hope not, especially with Scheffler, because if anything ever happens to Scheffler, I don't know how the PGA would recover. But where we, while there was a thought process a couple of months ago that maybe we were headed towards some, if not peace, at least detente, where we could somehow come up with more than just four tournaments a year where we would have all the best players in the world, have the top 50 players in the world in one place like we did at the Masters. Golf needs that. It desperately needs that. The PGA needs that. But now it seems like should Rory announce any time here in the next couple of weeks, that he is off to live. And every indication is that he's close. It is just another, another nail in the PGA coffin. This is not a good situation. The PGA can talk tough. And you even hear some PGA guys talking about, well, we can wait them out for the next generation of players. Oh, really? That's a lot of years to do that. That's a, that's a very tough way to go. Is it feasible? I guess it could be feasible in the long run, but it'd be a lot of pain before there'd be any gain. If anything, golf comes out of the Masters in worse shape than it went into it. There was no love lost. There was not a lot of attention played to the live players. The players didn't show up well on the board. Despite Cameron Smith's play the last two days, the bottom line is, right now, the PGA continues this battle, and it has not been a winning one, and their product is suffering. The live product is not compelling. I don't think in America it is... Their ratings are awful. There's nothing they will do, and I don't buy the team concept. I don't like anything they, anything about the way they have set up their structure. Nothing. All right, I might be a traditionalist. That's fine. The bottom line is sports are about tradition. They're about stadiums and uniforms and teams and classics. You go to the Masters and you think back and you draw a line from Bobby Jones through Ben Hogan, through Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicklaus, through all the great players who have come, through the players who took over then from Watson to Faldo to uh, Mickelson to Tiger Woods to all the way through to Scotty Scheffler. You draw a line and you compare and you draw the history, and that's what sports is about. That's where the legacy is. That's where the history is and the tradition. And that matters in sports. 
So Live thinks we just get a bunch of players together, come up with a new co- format, play some rock music, and away we go. Well, it hasn't worked. Their numbers are awful. But it doesn't mean they haven't divided the field and really hurt the PGA, and they've hurt it in a big way, and it looks like it's going to get hit again. Now, the news uh, yesterday that I heard, and I'm sure everybody knows now, is that uh, after a long, long run of consecutive games of years and years, John Sterling is uh, stepping down as the voice of the Yankees. Hey, we all know time is undefeated. Okay, eventually everybody has to step away, no matter how much and how long you've been in any position. Okay, those of us who are fortunate to be in one job for a very long time know that there comes a time when it's time to pass it on to somebody else. Now that time has come for John, and he steps back from uh, a terrific career, a long, you know, a career that started long before the Yankees, but it was obviously those Yankee years, and there have been many of them, that will, he will long be remembered for. I go way back with John Sterling, not back to the days of Mike and the Mad Dog, which are now way back. I go back to when I was in grammar school, and I used to listen to John Sterling doing a sports talk show on WMCA when I was in grammar school. I can remember him doing the show on WMCA. I can remember his commercials, La Vere Galant, doing the, the restaurant commercials. I can still remember him doing the live reads. I can remember him to this day. I can remember the way he did his talk show. In those days, there were talk shows on at night. None during the day. No one was on in what was considered radio prime time, morning drive, afternoon drive. They were all on after 6 o'clock. You had Art Rust. You had John Sterling. Before that, you had Bill Mazer. You had Jack Spector. You had all these different shows. Then Richard Neer had a show before Fan had a show on WNEW. And I listened to all of them. Because I obviously had a keen interest in sports long before I realized that this is where I was going to head. Long before I thought about ever going that route with my life. I can tell you, I wasn't there in grammar school thinking, oh, I'm going to replace one of these guys. I thought that before a fan ever started, but I didn't think it back in those days. I just was a great sports fan and used to love to listen to anything, digest anything that was sports. There's no question about it. And I listened to John all the way back to those days. I remember John as a broadcaster with the Islanders. I remember him as a broadcaster doing all different events and doing Atlanta Brave games and TBS games and Atlanta Hawk games as friendship with Kevin Lockery and all the different things that went on before he became the radio voice of the Yankees. And when that happened, little did he know that that would be, you know, everyone thinks television, 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 but the radio voice of a baseball team has a special hold on the team and on the city it's in. He is the voice of the team. He is the soundtrack of that team's history. Because the TV guys go away when the games get their biggest. They don't play in October. They give way to network broadcasts and they go away. 
the radio voices don't go away. They're there for every dramatic moment. They're there for every heartbreaking defeat in the playoffs. They're there for every big win in the World Series. And obviously, he got a chance to be part of a Yankee dynasty. And to be the voice of the Yankees during that wonderful time. A time where they've done nothing but win. A time where they've produced so many wonderful, dramatically impressive players. From Mariano to Jeter, etc. Through Bernie and Paul O'Neill. Let me go down the list. We know the accomplishments of the team. And he was there for every bit of that. And it's funny. Everyone talks about their favorite home run call and how these home run calls really became a cottage industry for him and became very much the symbol of his work and became wildly popular with the fan base. Back to the days when these calls started, my favorite call and one that I remember that Dog and I played over and over again, ironically, wasn't a home run call. And I remember we wore it out. We played it so much. It was a regular season game. Late in the game, Bernie Williams cleared the bases with a bases-loaded triple. And John Sterling got so excited and at the top of his voice gave us this classic call that I'll never forget. Bernie goes boom. Later on, you heard burn, baby burn, as he came up with his patented home run calls. But this wasn't a home run call. This was a triple, a late inning, three-run, bases-clearing triple that led to a Yankee victory over the Rays. And it was Bernie goes boom. And I'm telling you, we wore it out. We played it over and over and over again. And I don't know that that call was the one that started it all, but it seems to me the first one that I can remember being so noteworthy. And then obviously, everywhere, every show, lived on the Sterling home run calls and played the Sterling home run calls. Dog and I played them, and let's be honest, I'm going to say this, and this is true, and I think my memory is good on this. The guy who really started the ritual of playing the Sterling home run calls was the dog. On our show, he loved to play them, and then each guy started to get his own as the years went on. I don't know what year he started giving each guy a patented home run call. I don't know which year that started, but I do remember that, I'm telling you, Mike and the Mad Dog used those Sterling calls all the time, and then they were the rage on every show. But the one who did it first was the dog. He was the one that launched this industry. I'm telling you, he did. So as John says goodbye, has his uh, well-deserved moment at Yankee Stadium. He is from the fans. He is from the team. And he is from all his contemporaries in New York and all the people who were in the business all these years. Uh, let me say congratulations on a wonderful career. You know, to have a great career, it's got to stand the test of time. He did. He was blessed with an incredible voice, and obviously he made a style all his own. It was different. Some didn't care for it, but the fans ate it up with both hands because it was theatrical, it was unique, and it was entertaining, and the fans wanted to be entertained. And they love regaling victories, and he's had a lot of them 
to regale and to put his patented call on. So here's to a wonderful career, John, and I wish you uh, many years of happiness uh, in these golden years. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.